Welcome back, everyone. This is episode 130 of the Jiu-Jitsu Dummies podcast. We are brought to you by Black Belt Digital Marketing. Anything you need to build your business on or offline, website design, Google Ads, graphic design, printing, absolutely anything we can help. Check us out at Black Belt Digital Marketing on Instagram or our website, bbdigitalmarketing.com. Request a free review of your online presence today. My name is Milton Campus. I'm a brown belt training out of South Florida. We got Bo and Christian behind the camera. Woo! Say hello. Hello. Don't forget to like, comment, download, share, and click that subscribe button. We'd really appreciate the support. Um, we should be uh, actually like a little record uh, record breaking moment, but just a, um, what would you call it? Like a milestone for us. A milestone. We're about to hit 10,000. By the time this airs, we'll be over 10,000 followers on Instagram. We've been over that on, on Facebook for a while, but... Uh, Excited, and I appreciate all the support, everybody. So joining us today is uh, co-founder of Effective Fitness Combatives. Uh, his name is Jay Wadsworth, and we're going to bring him in in just a second. We'll do a few quick shout-outs. So thank you to our friends over at Flow and Roll. Hands down, the best custom gi and no-gi gear in the business. Don't believe us. Visit them on Instagram at flow underscore and underscore roll. Check out all the custom designs they've created for academies across the country. We had, we've got a new design that we're doing with them, and uh, excited to put that out. But you can go check them out, again, on Flo, uh, at Flow and Roll on IG or their website, flowenroll.com. You get 20% off with code JJD for any of their the items they sell on their website. And don't forget, they have an awesome pre-order program for gyms or academies across the country where they will um, basically like you lay li a very little money out of pocket. And then they put your gear online for your students and people to order and you don't have to lay out much money and basically those you know the people that are ordering your stuff really pays for the uh for, for the full order that you're going to wind up getting especially if you want to stock up your own academy so check them out again flowenroll.com i uh, also want to thank leo optics these are my favorites i i forgot to bring a pair to give you <laughs> sorry man it's all right man. uh these are i have i have one i found one extra pair that they sent me so Leo Optics is a, a sunglass and apparel company specializing in these uh, signature bamboo glasses. I love them. They give you the little, you know about these guys? You know, they give you the little, uh, I'm not a black belt. I know that the red is like usually res uh, reserved for, for black belt, but uh, they did send these to me and uh, have a bunch to, to give out to, uh, to our listeners and to guests. Uh, their passion is rooted in the jujitsu lifestyle founded in Southern California with obviously, you know, all different types of products ref reflecting the BJJ lifestyle. So go check them out at leooptics.com. And the code there is JJD for 10% off. Okay. Also, thank you to BioPro Technology. Uh, this is, you, you said, Jay, you said you, you tried it? Yeah, I just tried it a couple months ago for the okay. first time. Yeah, this was, um, I mean, this is my favorite new thing. Uh, very open about what I've been doing. You know, I started with, I told you before, like Astroflave. And then I added this in a couple of months later, and it just like That's it's awesome. been crazy. Um, you know, again, I'm not scared to say I'm, it turns you into a walking boner between the two of them. <laughs> I swear to God. So uh, you know, it's supposed to help with anti aging, metabolism, libido, immune system, skin, cognition. Uh, there's a the second one here. I don't know if we have both of them on camera, right? Do we have both, right? So the second one is the the quarter sleep. Uh, so it helps you with uh, you know getting to sleep and stress. So all of this, no needles, no side effects, a little vial, you shake it up, you put it under your tongue for 90 seconds, and you go about your day. You can check them out at bioproteamtech.com, and you get $30 off with code JJD on their regularly priced kits, and your order's got a total of more than $295. So once you hit that $295 or $300 mark, put in code JJD, and you're going to get 30 bucks off. Okay? That's it. Welcome, Jay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming out. You're coming from where now? You said you, you drove down from? Yeah, so we just relocated uh, to the Fort Myers, Cape Coral area in Florida, okay. so I'm just on the West Coast. So we were saying you're the co-founder of Effective Fitness Combatives. You're a black belt. Correct. Second and year, yeah. you're also a SWAT operator? I was, yeah. yeah. I Is, recently retired in April. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Congratulations. Good move. You, you happy about that? Yeah. <laughs> EFC blew up, and it was like, uh, either I'm going to bottleneck EFC or I'm going to retire. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. I like to hear that, man. I left my uh, my job a couple of years ago to do the podcast more. Yeah. And then I opened up a marketing company too. I was just like I was sick of working for other people. So I had twenty two years in in New York. You have to only have twenty. So yeah. Um, I was at the point where I could retire. Where in New York? Uh, it's just south of Buffalo. Okay. I was uh, a Long Islander. I went to yeah. I went I did a year of college at SUNY Albany. Okay. Yeah. They didn't want me back after that first year. <laughs> 
did a, I was on the drinking program. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I didn't spend a lot of time there. My parents were like, you should probably come home. Let's go to some community college for a little bit. I'm headed to Long Island uh, Sunday for a couple of weeks. What are you doing? You mentioned uh, so, you doing a program up there. Yeah. So in 2016, I was approached by DCGS, which is like a post, uh, like law enforcement standards for New York State. Okay. They govern everyone but New York City in the state and asked me to basically like revamp the defensive tactics instructor course, which is 80. Okay. Hours. So I revamped it. And over a period of two years, we ran a bunch of uh, pilot programs uh, at all the zone academies to get feedback from different people. I had to pick a team of guys that are law enforcement mm -hmm. um, that, that were DT instructors or were going to certify as DT instructors that would be part of the cadre for that. Um, and after the two years, it, it got voted past like the municipal police council. And it's now the, standard to be able to teach at an academy in new york state is that 80 hour program so you said nassau county is it what yeah. is it a specific uh, like a city department or a town department or is it nassau county it's nassau county is hosting right. it okay. so um they probably have like 10 slots because they're a, a large agency of full-time uh, dt staff yeah uh, in the academy and then um they open it up so basically post will send an email out and say hey we're holding course course here and we only take 24 students Okay. So um, at like 200, he cuts registration off, and then we pick uh, 24 out of that. Usually by reaching out to the zone academy, be like, hey, who's teaching at the academy, or who do you want teaching at your academy? And we'll give them first picks to get in there because people put in two, three years in a row and don't get in there. We're only doing four course, courses a year. Wow. So, so what's, what is the state of jujitsu, you know, as it pertains to law enforcement? Uh, I mean, it, it, it seems, you know, from somebody that does jujitsu, we're, we're we're gaining some traction with with, with the law enforcement commu community. How are we doing now, and what's been holding us back? Yeah, so I, I think what's been holding us back is just uh, in the profession of policing, there is, um, it's hard to get change, and, and yeah. I think the military is that way too. It's hard to get change in things that they're uncomfortable with or they know they're not good at. Mm -hmm. uh, to change in something that is easy or simple is, is not hard at all, mm -hmm. and so I think getting jujitsu in. The hardest part is, is like up until 1993, no one in the States really knew what jujitsu was. So they start DT uh, a few decades before that in policing. And what do you get? And you're getting the other martial arts that aren't true forms of being tested uh, with full resistance in an all out combative fight or match where sure. if you take your sports like judo and wrestling and jujitsu and Muay Thai, like they're fighting each other or even in sparring in the gym on a weekly basis, they're giving full resistance or, or at least a lot of resistance against sure. each other so we want to draw the fundamental skills from those martial arts and put into what we're doing you know there's a huge difference in rule set from mma than in the street we all know that but the skills that you develop that work in mma are going to also work in the street if we can integrate them into what the environment is so it's like hey let's pull from them skills uh i'm a second degree black belt and so when i first started doing like jujitsu for police stuff was back in like 2010, 11, and I was too sport jiu y in my combatives curriculums. Okay. Okay. Um, so like now fast forward to 2023 where I've built DCGS curriculum. Uh, I teach at all these conferences across the state and then I have EFC curriculum. Um, it's all built in principles with the fundamentals of jujitsu skills, mm -hmm. right? So people are like, why is jujitsu so important? Because you're going to build your skill set 20 times faster than if you don't train jujitsu, right? And now if you know, have the skills for me to give you the tactics in the street, wait, that that's easy. That makes sense. Yeah. It, it's building the skills that, that holds us back. I did my first ever um, set like a uh, police seminar, yeah. you know, the yep. defensive tactics. Uh, uh, somebody did a seminar down in Miami and I went and it was less like, okay, I know this stuff. And it was just like these little tweaks of like, okay, when you do, you know, I'm doing the Kimura to submit somebody versus doing the Kimura, getting their back, holding their leg with my, you know, right, sitting on their yep. back, holding my, holding their arm with my leg. I'm just like, oh, it's it's like a, a small leap. It's a, yeah. not even a leap. I mean, it's just a small change in what you do or now add this and now you're cuffing somebody. Yeah. So it was like, it was pretty eye opening. I mean, it was the first time I was like, I've seen it and it's, it felt obvious, but to actually do it and to literally have handcuffs and be handcuffing somebody was uh was was a bit eye opening, but it was it was good. I think every I think no matter who you are, no matter what you do, I think taking a, a defensive tactics, a police defensive tactics class is smart, and yeah. you kind of see what you've been missing, what what you're not getting, and really what we do. Like you know, I'm in a sport jujitsu place, yeah. 
right? You know, we're you know we're pulling guard and you know we're starting from our butts and, and stuff right. like that. So, um, yeah, I hadn't really seen that other side, you know. So it's it's been good. And that's the big thing where like two now, like okay, I love jujitsu, right? Mm-hmm. Second degree jujitsu black belt. Like I love jujitsu; it's my lifestyle. But I also look at okay now if we're on our feet, the wrestling fundamentals are almost more important. Right, because yeah. most jujitsu guys aren't very good on their feet, or let's say half of them pull guard and half of them don't. But like, we start almost all our encounters uh, on our feet there. Yeah. So now we take those fundamentals and those skills, and then we integrate them. And then on, in jujitsu on the ground, I feel like jujitsu is more of a self defense oriented uh, skill than wrestling is. So like in jujitsu, we face the problem, and we might not be off our back yet but at least we're facing the problem so we can see this comes in important because in wrestling if we turn our back to bail out because we don't be pinned then we can't see either of his hands we can't see if he's trying to present a weapon if you're carrying that gun belt the exposure to getting weapons out is so much harder or so much easier for the bad guy from the back than it is from the front okay. right so now you have to integrate those two in, together from vertical to the horizontal plane right so that's one of the big things and then like you mentioned it kimura Right, so a lot of jujitsu guys, and especially black belts, they love teaching cops kimura, and it's a super strong move. In the context of the environment, you have to understand. I'm not saying not to do the kimura, but you have to understand how you integrate it in properly, because what we do is we take two hands to one side of the guy's body. Okay, and now you and I both know, like uh, every time we go for a kimura, we don't finish. Um, it doesn't happen right away usually. Sometimes it might, yeah. but. What do we not have to worry about in jujitsu that we have to worry about on the street? His other hand, his other a, hand, a friend, uh, somebody his else hand, that might, you know, right? jump so in. L- let's go with his other hand okay. and then yeah. the weapons we have and yeah. the weapons he might have. Sure. So if I commit two hands to one side of his body and my head's on that side of the body, yeah. I don't know what that other hand is doing. Is sure. it taking stuff off my belt? Is it presenting my own weapon? Uh, those types of things. So we have to understand, we have to make the differences or we have to integrate it with a little bit of changes when we put it in there. And that's where like EFC has just hit it all the park is our integration of the environment and the weapon systems into the skills of jujitsu and wrestling. Yeah. Have you seen some of these videos lately? Like, uh, I, know, I know my buddy's doing it. Like, uh, they're just like throwing a gun on, like two guys are rolling yeah. and then they throw a gun on the mat and they're like, oh shit. Like, yeah. have you seen that? What do you think about that kind of stuff? So, yeah. so this is what that does. We, uh, no. we call that the fumble drill. Yeah. What if I'm trying to, what if I'm a police officer and I don't practice when to present in the clinch? So when I'm trying to present, I actually am fundamentally at a weak position. So if I don't have certain concepts or the right timing of present the contested gun presentation, or you grab it or it hits and knocks out, or maybe like I fall and I drop it. So now that gun's loose, right? So, so you, you're, you've got your hand on your gun, and now you're only fighting with, well, I mean, you've got maybe the three yeah. limbs, but really, right, you're only fighting right. with one hand. So, so they, now you're at a disadvantage right. until you fully present, right? Yes. And so we have a, a whole module of when do you present in a clinch or in an entanglement, okay? uh, which is, I think we're the only company that teaches that block, realistically, uh, to, to those concepts. Um, some other ones are kind of doing it, but like the exact modules, like in and fighting around things is is important um but the the importance of that is is like okay hey the gun's on the ground now could a gun fall could a gun get loose in in the fight yes could they try to take it out and you defend it but the gun falls okay so now how do we control that weapon okay so now i have to get to the weapon you have to get to the weapon it's just like a fumble drill yeah right and most people are scared of the the slide of the gun most police officers are scared of the slide of the gun but that's the leverage point of that weapon so we have to understand that the difference between like a knife and a gun is I can control the leverage point if I'm trying to take it or or keep it and vice versa. So I, I think it puts in a skill set of like, hey, this is a, uh, eye-opening to, hey, we're fighting for a gun now. It's not just jujitsu. It's not just striking. Um, and more so striking arts are like I would just punch this guy. Now I'm taking one hand off the gun to punch the guy, which may or may not change his behavior, may or may not have an effect on him. Depending, it may piss him off. May piss him off. Yeah. Adrenaline is is a crazy drug, right? Depending on all the other types of drugs and controlled substances, alcohol people could be on. So I prefer to keep get both hands on that weapon and and, and win the leverage point of that. Use my head to headbutt, maybe my knees to strike somewhere, but I'm fighting with both hands on that. But those scramble drills are just good awareness to hey, it's on the ground. 
So when you, when you're teaching your defensive tactics, you are including elements of, of striking. Yeah, yeah. It's, so you know, the, and and that's the other thing. Like, uh, we consider ourselves at EFC a full spectrum combative course. So we will teach skill building first. We develop skills. It's individual and and uh, partner drills where we're just drilling arm drags, shrimping. What's an underhook? What's an overhook? It's crazy because you've been training for years, I'm right? Nine years, going on ten. Years. If I told you people don't know what an overhook is, you'd look at me like I'm silly. Pummeling is one of the hardest things we teach because mm -hmm. they want to hug. Yeah, that other hand doesn't want to overhook and wants to just go up towards the head or the shoulder. But what's the good thing about that? If you're fighting an untrained person on the street and you win an underhook and he doesn't whizzer, then you know his skill set's probably not good unless he's super skilled and he's going for like a five point, you know, sacrifice throw or something. Okay. Um, so again, those skill building modules help assess what human behavior does, you know? So um, we teach the ground then on the point of like dominating from bad positions in police work or self-defense realistically what is our goal on the ground if our backs on the ground we don't consider guard neutral we consider it bettering a position okay so if you're in mount it's a really bad position if i go back to guard but i still have my gun belt on and the guy's still on top of me and i can't stand up i still can't get mobile again i still can't engage or disengage if i need to for multiple suspects so like i've bettered my position minimized damage a little bit more from that position mm -hmm. but i still got to continue to get on top or back to my feet and that is our main goal get on top or back to our feet we don't want to be underneath people sure. um and that's mainly because of the environment and the unknowns that come in that is, is that a is that a little like a, a bad habit that guys have, that do train jujitsu have that they're comfortable i know i'm comfortable yeah. on the bottom i'm usually uh, i have some big guys in my gym but for the most part most people are smaller than me so i tend to pull guard for them yeah. Because then it's just me getting on top of them and holding them down right. and, you know, and, and it's no fun for them. They're not learning. Um, do, is, it, is it a bad habit that you really kind of have to beat out of these guys in, in some cases? It is because, like, you got to understand, like, even if you're super skilled there uh, in jujitsu, you don't have to worry about them starting to go for your weapons. Yeah. Right. They don't have to worry about them presenting a weapon. And then when those things happen ultra fast then now you have to make the decision of how am I going to sweep this guy or pop up? And it might not take you long to sweep an unskilled person, but in the law enforcement world, we don't get to pick who and when we're fighting. So there's not weight classes. So attributes make a difference, right? Like yeah. you and I know if you take a guy your size versus an unskilled guy your size, you're going to dominate him, okay? If I take a guy your size that's not skilled, I'm going to dominate him. But I go against you, it's not going to be domination at all. Size and strength makes a difference when sure. the, the skill is in the same ballpark, right? Yeah. So again, now we have to think, okay, what works across the board for all shapes and all sizes with difference in attributes? And that's, that's like, again, part of our curriculum is why we teach the things that we do is because the environment is unknown. And we know there's weapons for sure there. We brought them, minimum. And we don't know the size and skill difference. What do, what do you think about... I mean, you, been, I've been thinking about this question a little bit and how to say it the right way. I know that there are, and I've, I've had some on the show, there are, are companies that go around doing seminars. And I know there, there are some in the law enforcement community that go, ah, that's not going to help. You know, I can't do one seminar. And you've said a couple of times your curriculum. Um, do you just do seminars or is it like, you know, I've been to a seminar. It was, you know, like think maybe four hours with a little break in between, maybe three hours with a break. Are you doing seminars like that as well? Do you just do you do a multi day? Is it only multi day? You know classes where that you're seeing a full curriculum. Is it we're doing this every month or we're doing this for a month? I explain that side to me and how you feel about the guys that are just going out doing a seminar and that's it. So I started out by doing jujitsu for cops seminars. Okay, two to four hour seminars, jujitsu for police. Sure, however you want to call it. Okay. Um, Looking back, I, I was too jujitsu y, like too much sports. You said jiu before, sports jiu jitsu, okay? yeah. Um, but anytime you go to a training, I don't care if it's one hour long or two weeks long, if you as a person take one thing that's going to better you or maybe save your life, like the training was worth it. Okay? Yeah. So just because you're only doing seminars doesn't mean it's not good or not worth it. Like in jujitsu, we go to four hour seminars all the time. That's not a whole yeah. curriculum that you get when you go train at your gym, sure. right? So it's just a different part of what they're learning uh we our instructor 
our instructor course is a curriculum. Mm -hmm. It is a set curriculum. It's it's start to finish in the order we want it in, which has been changed a few times for building retention, building them extra reps in. But uh, we also break those down into one, two, and three-day trainings, custom courses. But when we do custom courses, we have to make sure, like, if someone calls and says, hey, I want a custom course, well, what do you want in? And if they pick, like, two complete things that don't tie into each other yet, I'll be like, listen, you want to do weapon-based entanglements. I get it. Weapons are fun. They're cool, <laughs> right? We want to defend against them and we want to take them out. But if you don't understand like some of the ground defense positions or especially for us, our one-man control tactics and takedowns, I have to teach you all of that stuff before we do weapon-based entanglements. Otherwise, yeah. it's just going to be uh, a, a mess out there. It, I, I would equate that to when somebody shows up at a at a jiu-jitsu academy for the first time and they think that they, they're just going to learn chokes yes. and they don't learn one submission for like maybe a week or you know, at least, definitely not the first day, they realize, okay, I've got to learn how to fall. You know, I've got to learn how to get up. You know, I have to learn all of these other things. Oh, they think they're coming in. Okay, I'm going to go home and know right. all these chokes, right? It's almost the same thing. It's like, you know, you got to know ABC first. Take from guard. Hey, I want to learn yeah. a submission from guard. Do you know how to break his posture first? Do you yeah. even know why breaking his posture is important? Yeah. Do you know how to destroy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you know how to dis uh, off balance him? Right? Like, can you sweep or escape without off balancing someone? Unless there's significant skill or uh, size difference attributes yeah, yeah. Th that doesn't happen right yeah. so uh the curriculum allows you to see or the skill building allows you to see like hey we need to develop these first um i just booked a two-day course up in panama city um and they want one officer control one officer takedown multiple officer control multiple officer takedown i can do that um in a day now we're going to be moving to get that done in a day because usually that's going to be done over about a day and a half but i can do that in a day Okay, especially give them the overview of the team tactics, so on and so forth. Then day two is an overview of weapon-based entanglements because weapon-based entanglements, again, is another day and a half program, right, without the skill building in there. Sure. But if I don't do the those solo tactics, they're going to be lost in the weapons-based entanglements. Vehicle extractions. Everyone wants to see our vehicle extractions, right? Uh, yanking guys out of cars for years at our job. Like, I've never had any issues pulling guys out of cars. Is because we have jobs, we know what to do, we're disciplined, we understand the skills, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to use that near side, let's say driver side resistance, most common driver side resistance is steering wheel. Yeah. The other seats are different. The other seats are I'm going in the car and putting my feet like in the frame. Really? Right? Because uh -huh. now they're moving away from you and using their feet to brace. Different forms of resistance. Sure. But driver side resistance. So the easiest thing to do is break that first side grip. But Think of the steering wheel as a clock. If I'm from 12 to 9, my grip breaks to the thumb. I need to bring that grip up as an X on the A pillar, which would be the front windshield pillar. Okay? Mm -hmm. If they're 9 and under, my thumb's on the outside, Completely I need to go yeah. down. But then I'm going to take the fulcrum of the elbow and put it on the B pillar. And my hug arm bar now, instead of my chest or mm -hmm. my two-on-one or Russian, instead of being my trust as a fulcrum, is that B pillar that's unforgiving. Right? So You're saying the, the door... the the, frame, the back of the door. The, the, frame, the frame right the behind door. you. Yep. Yeah. So uh, okay. just so people understand when I say A frame, B frame, C frame, D frame, like those are pillars, whatever pillars we're talking about. So the windshield is the first pillar in That's the door. A. That's A. And it goes alphabetically backwards. Okay, backwards. Okay. All right. So the B one is directly behind the driver. You put that elbow on that and then put that, hug, that Russian hug on bar, whatever you want to call it, two on one, onto that B pillar. They, those dudes want to come out. Yeah. Now the seatbelt may not be letting them come out. Yeah. He wants to come out, and that's that's a two guys job. Sure. So how? So let's go to when I did that seminar again. Yep. I'm not in law enforcement. I did it because the the guy that was doing it was a client. We were doing some work with him, and I was just like, "Yeah, I'm going to come down and support, yeah. and I'm you know love to learn and see what he does." And I again, I know I got some had some people that were like, "Ah, eh, you know, you're not going to treat somebody all of everything they need." And and I came out of that going, "This should be." For anybody in law enforcement that's there, more than anything, a one-day seminar where you're learning lots of bits and pieces should not be like, okay, now I know how to do this and I'm going to go like use this. I felt like it was a wake-up call to go, oh, we need to learn. We, I need to be training this all the time, and hopefully they do get into an academy. And the, some of the people that I spoke to who had never done jujitsu or anything before, I told them, I said, look, you need to find—we were actually—you know, the guy came in from out of town, but we were in uh, an academy where the, the owner— 
was former law enforcement. So he was teaching some of these tactics already. But I said, you need to find, you need to, if you can come here, you need to like, you know, enroll in this school right here. But, you know, I don't think as law enforcement, if you can find a, an academy that has somebody who is, you know, former law or active law enforcement, you should go there. If you're going to go to a school like mine, you are going to learn that sport jujitsu. And now it's completely different. You're not going to be learning like, hey, when, am, when are we learning how to handcuff? Like, that's not going to happen. Uh, but I did just think that those seminars were great. Those should be eye-opening moments for those cops. to, And more than anything, they, they need to realize what they don't know. It was like really eye opening. There were so, there were some like um, like school law enforcement. What do they call those? Like RSOs. Yeah. Or no, so, sorry, SROs. Okay, so like you know, they're you know they're dealing with kids and teenagers and things like that, and they like knew nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Like this was all. And and I hats off to them for coming and doing it. But like some of these people knew nothing. And again, some of those conversations were like, this should you should get in, you need to get into a place. Like they were all loving it. I mean, I don't know what the numbers are, but I, I can pretty much guess that it's probably in the single digits, the percentage wise of how many people actually wound up, you know, signing up for, uh, for, for a jujitsu, you know, class or academy. What is your take on, all right. So a lot of what you do is you're training somebody to then train others. You're going into a, 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 a department and training. If they had the instructor, you, course, you're going to yes. give them, you're going to certify instructors to then instruct others. Do those instructors need to have a, um, like a, a jujitsu past or some type of combative training prior, or could there be somebody that's never done anything, never thrown a hand, never done jujitsu that is is going to get the certification? So we have what we call our level one, and then our level two, okay. and then what we do is we build a back end with a video library system and a skill development module, so they can come and if they're competent and they pass the level one, they mm -hmm. can teach level one stuff. Okay. But we we want them to continue to get better. They have to take that back end, of those videos. So everything we teach is on full video, on the app, on their phone, they can go look. Okay. So when they leave, they can train. Now we teach to what we call the competent level person. Someone that can understand it, but we, we want them, they have to be able to demo, and they have to be able to break that down. Okay, and then they have to be able to present. So there's a lot that goes into instructing, right? Sure. So not everybody passes the instructor course. They could go to the instructor course, and they might not be at the point where they're going to be able to pass. They may be able to do the moves, but then they really can't get in front of a group and, and teach Correct. it, though, right? You know, and then it's... we'll have guys that can do the moves that can't get in front of a group and teach it. Yeah. Right? So then, okay, maybe they get the completion of the course. They get a certification that they completed the course, but not the instructor certification. Now they have all the information. They have the baseline. They have all the videos go back and train again and then come back through, Right so that they can go back and teach. Mm -hmm. um, so it's super important to understand that they have to be able to do this, but we also have to think of like, a lot of jujitsu guys I ask this question, like, hey, they don't have a jujitsu background, can they get the instructor certification? Well, what if it's just a black belt in jujitsu and he's super skilled, but he doesn't have the handgun retention and he doesn't have the handgun presentation skills, should he not be able to teach it there, right? How competent is it? He's so skilled in the hands-on stuff. Now I can give him that bridge the gap, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just jujitsu skills when we talk about law enforcement, right? The jujitsu skills are so important because our goal in a hands-on use of force is control and custody, okay? And jujitsu gives us the skills to be controlled. So we urge people, like you said earlier, to go to jujitsu gym, even if they don't have a law enforcement program, because their skills are going to go up way faster, sure. okay? We can bridge that gap faster with people with skills than we can with people that don't have the skills, okay? But the modules are, like in a combatist course, there's so many different skills. Um, for instance, I know a black belt uh, that I've trained with for years, and he's he's very good. He's, he's much bigger than me. I've trained with him for years. He's really good on the mat. Uh, he's, he's a SWAT guy. Um, and so he's good with weapons and stuff too, right? But when he went to the state instructor course, the first two days are like slick. We're training slick like we would in the gym. No added weapons, anything. And when we add a little bit of resistance in, you know, we'll, we want them to see failure. Not like where it's 100 versus 100, like gym class hero. Mm -hmm. But, hey, cops going 80%. Suspects going um, just enough to show them struggle where their first move isn't working. I want them to solve the problem into other sequences. Mm -hmm. right? So he's just sweeping people, toying with them, 
taking them down uh, when they're trying to do it to him his little bit of struggle is like causing them all sorts of action sure we- special thank you to the crew over at flow and roll for all their support flow and roll is renowned for their incredible nogi rash guards shorts and leggings flow and roll has quickly become the premier custom apparel provider for academies big and small throughout the united states reach out today to discuss your custom order and ask about their incredible pre-order program you can send an email to flowenroll at gmail.com or visit their Instagram at flow underscore n underscore roll and shoot them a direct message. And yes, they can create an awesome custom gi for your academy as well. Visit flowenroll.com to check out their awesome designs and while you're there, pick up a jujitsu dummy signature tee exclusively at flowenroll.com. And remember, you'll get 20% off your purchase of t-shirts, rash guards, or gis with code JJD. We throw the gun belts on. He's dominating them. Doesn't realize his gun's gone twice. Really? Right? And then yeah. doesn't even realize they're trying to take it. Right? So it's a completely different mindset of, oh, now I have to be careful. It's he's so jujitsu oriented minded that he forgot that we are doing now some, some minimal resistant in sparring, but now his gun belt's in play. Yeah. Right? So like, that was eye opening, and he's a perfectionist. He obviously cleaned that up in a, a couple of days, and then was was just well above the standard because he earned that standard in his own time, right? Sweat and tears. So we urge people, even if there's no jujitsu, like police program in a jujitsu gym near them, uh, still get there, still train. Something because, is better than nothing, and we know. Like, but you know, just on top of the skills, jujitsu makes you uncomfortable. It gets you used to being uncomfortable. So now if you're uncomfortable and like, oh, okay, I can do this, you're making critical decisions under stress much more calculated than you would if you're just freaking out, right? So plus what's jujitsu do for your lifestyle? Health, you know. Cleans it up. Yeah, cleans everything up. So jujitsu across the board I don't go drinking on a Friday night because I want to go to, you know, class on a a Saturday morning, you know. Right. So like jujitsu overall is amazing, Yeah. right? And and we tell everyone they should. And, And then we think the hardest part of getting police to do that is, they just don't want to realize how bad they are at first. Yeah. Like you have to check your ego and, and go in there. You know, yeah. one of the things we do at ESC. Do, do you feel like that's, is that yeah. the hardest step? Mm-hmm. Is sure. that that like, man, I'm going to. Listen, people say they can't like find two hours a week to train once a week. You can't find two hours, right? Half hour there, train for an hour, half hour back. I guarantee you, you could cut your screen time down two hours a week. I guarantee you, you can take one of the eight TV shows you watch and not watch. We can find, I hear what do people say, like you find time for the things that are important to you. You always find time for those oh, things. I, I can't. Jiu-Jitsu membership is so expensive. Mm. Most, most Jiu-Jitsu guys want to help the community. The yeah. Jiu-Jitsu gyms want to help the community. Most of them, right? Like yeah, I would say the overwhelming yeah. majority. A lot of them give police discounts. Sure. I can't, I can't afford $125 a month. But I drive a so, nine, $900 truck around and have a sidecar and ATV and, so let, let, let's talk about that side. Let's talk about uh, Christian. Can you queue up that video in a second? But, but not don't put it up just yet. But when we talk about cost, I'm always thinking about. I know for the last few years that was, or not the last few years, but for a while, a big sticking point for departments were like the cost. And when I've talked to people about it, it wasn't just the cost of the program, but what if somebody gets hurt and now you've got people like going out on. Uh, you know, disability or they're out on leave, right? But isn't the cost of get, of like the department getting sued for, you know, you know, hurting, uh, you know, hurting somebody or shooting so, all of these, these shootings that were like, you know, it's almost always like a scared officer that, you know, maybe pulled his gun too early or is shooting versus having that confidence of dealing with the situation, right? With his hands and, and his, his, his voice first, right? Stress yeah, and fear. Yeah. Right. And if you're not un- if you're not used to being uncomfortable and you don't train, yeah. not just in jujitsu, right? Like you have to train in jujitsu, but like you have to train your your uh tactics, your your handgun tactics, that stuff too, right? Taser, uh mm-hmm. over reliance all the time. But we don't train enough on that to switch back to hands on or to go to lethal, depending on what the situation is from there. Those those are all forms of de escalation. Like everyone's on the two the the de escalation train. Verbally yeah. de escalate it. Well, that takes two willing parties. Not just the suspect, but the cop also, right? But if one of them fails to de-escalate, the next level of de-escalation is, do I have good hands-on skills? So do you feel somebody with combative skills, jujitsu skills, are more likely to maybe spend more time or be more confident 
to de-escalate. Oh, you guess? Hand, hands right? down, yeah. Right? Because they, they don't need to they don't need to be overbearing. Like I'll be I'll control the situation. Like they're gonna know I'm in control, but I know if it goes bad uh and I need to go hands on, that's my option. It's that confidence yeah. that you're presenting Correct. like this guy could be bigger than you and he's so used to being the bully or people like moving out of his way, right? You know, and, and here you are, maybe you're smaller and you're talking to him, this whatever, this person. And they they realize they see your confidence, and then they start to go, well, yeah, maybe I'm about to get my ass handed to me, right? I mean, that's right. the that's the, the what's going on in somebody's mind, whether it's like in the back of the mind or like super apparent to them. They're going, well, oh, this guy, like maybe I don't want to mess with this guy, and maybe I do need yes. to listen to what he's telling me, and I need to, you know, not resist or you know. The one thing that helped me with two on the street was like I don't need to prove myself to these guys out here. I'm yeah. in the gym every day proving yourself to myself. Yeah. Right. This is a professional job. He he can tell me he's stronger, bigger than me. He's beat me up. If you didn't have that gun and badge, I would kick your ass. Okay. Yeah. You probably would. <laughs> right here. Let's let's just not have it cause another charge for you. Let's just and you know what I mean? I don't need to be like, oh you what? You know, I yeah. I know I'm gonna probably be able to handle myself, take him into custody yeah. if I need to. So like that's where jujitsu plays a, a huge part into it. And I think people just don't want to understand it because they have to check their ego. Jiu-jitsu is not easy in the beginning. Yeah. Right? Like you go in there and you're humbled. Like you're I'm I wear a good badge and a gun and I'm supposed to be this cop. And I might have, you know, huge muscles from lifting. And I go in there and I get humbled by 140 pound dudes. Yeah. Yeah. It's an experience. Some people don't want it, you know. Do you believe uh, and I and I've used this example just about any time we've, we've talked about law enforcement, I've always used this example. My dad was a, a cop in New York City for 23 years. He was on the New York Transit Police Department before they, the departments merged, right? Before yep. it became the NYPD. He retired right as they were merging. Um, he did not have to take one continuing education, physical education class ever. This is, uh, you know, what, when did he retire? And then, like, probably in the 90s, like... Uh, early nineties. Not much has changed. Ne that was never. Uh, so, I mean, you could teach these classes, but until you also get these guys in shape, like, you know, we've all seen the fat cop, you know, on his back looking like mm -hmm. a turtle trying to like, you know, grab somebody and, you know, even a, a woman is pushing over a guy, you know, we've all seen those videos. And I, how does that play into what you do? Does that play into what you do? And and what do these departments think about that? Are there are there departments that do have a physical education requirement? Like you were too fat to be out on the, you know, I'm going to put you behind a desk, or can they get fired? Does that exist so, anywhere? So that is another major downfall of the profession mm -hmm. is you go to an academy, train somewhere between six months and nine months. Okay, all all skills that you need to 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 understand or or an intro to them. Okay, and you do PT every day. They run you four, five, six miles a day, mm -hmm. okay? But when you get out, there's no PT standard after that. It just doesn't make sense. There's no there's no standard of, hey, you have to train this many hours of hands-on skills a month or this many a year. Like when I first started going around for the state in 16, I say, how many people in here have trained hands-on skills in the last two, three years? It's like nobody. Yeah. It's getting better. There are departments that are on their own implementing uh, this. States like Pennsylvania, they've implemented everyone is mandatory now to do four years of hands-on training a year. You and I four, both you know. You said four years a year. You meant four, four hours, hours a yeah, year. Okay. Four hours a year. Okay. You and I both know that that might help with an intro, mm -hmm. but like your skills aren't going to be any better after four hours. Like it, It's the amount of time right. when I'm doing those four hours at the end of it, I'm probably going to be really good for a few days, a few weeks. If I miss jujitsu yes. for a day, like a couple of days, and I get off my routine, I think we've all been in a place where we go back and we're just like, I feel rusty, right? My buddy Brian can imagine a big if it's weeks or guy. years, you know. Yeah, my buddy Brian's a big hand guy. Guy, he calls that the training hangover. Yeah, he says when we walk out of training, we're getting worse until we train again. Yeah, that uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And it's that that's how it is. So like, we have to figure out how to get legislation to make training mandatory mm -hmm. and the departments have to pay for this. They have, yeah. have to do it. So like, okay, there's, I don't know the exact schedule. I'm trying to get my hands on it, but there was a proposed schedule at my agency about three years ago to make it go to 10 hour shifts from eight. Okay. But in that 
What would it be like? Three on, three or four on, and then three I'm, off, or something like that. I'm four on, three off. Trying to find off. it. I, my, my dad had that schedule yeah. for a long time. Four I'm trying on, to three find off. Because this one had an eight-hour training day built in every two okay. weeks. So every two weeks, Makes you're sense. getting an eight-hour training day. So now they're on duty training. That's they're going to work to train twice a month. Now they're training. That yeah. that would Makes make sense. it continuous, right? They'd be yeah. continually training. So um, there are ways to do it. Departments one aren't going to do it because of money unless legislation says they have to. Mm. So again, it comes back onto the the people making the decisions of what has to happen, or what are they mandatory to do, so on. And, and each state's different. Each post is different. They even, I think the only thing, the only requirement, I mean, you had to, like, I guess you had to take a physical, a physical exam. There was a height requirement in New York City that's, I think, gone, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, so now you see, like, little... Right, yeah little man, man or woman, you know, yeah. and, and you're like, well, how are they, how are they able to yeah. do it? And, you know, you might just see them and you might not know if they train or not, but just that size difference is there's at such a disadvantage yeah. right off the bat. It's, and then they're out of shape on top of it. Yeah. You know, we're, we're at a place in society where police officers live in a glass house and that's fine that they're a profession, they're a public profession. I have no problems with that, but the expectations are that they are trained robots. Yeah. They are the farthest from trained robots, right? So like we need, if we want to put that expectation on them, then we need to give them the training for that expectation, right? There's human error in there. And now take like fitness is the foundation of everything. We know that, but there's also a different difference in what kind of fitness. Hey, I can go to the gym and lift weights. Okay. I can be a marathon runner and run. And then, I put one of those guys on the mat after three minutes. I love when those big guys come in. Like They're oh, exhausted. <laughs> They're exhausted, right? And they can't fight anymore. The marathon runner that just ran 26.2 miles or whatever it is, then in 90 seconds he's exhausted. Yeah. Right? It's so a, it's a, it's why different. don't we it's... start doing our PT different in the academy too? Why don't we say, hey, instead of running these guys four to five miles, six miles a day, because foot pursuits don't last that long. Right. When's the last time you saw a cop run four or five miles in an incident? Maybe never, uh, with the exception of maybe 9-11, people were running blocks and, and flights. Maybe, right? But that is an extreme exception. Sure. Okay. So why not integrate jujitsu in either three mornings for PT or evenings for PT or integrate it in at least two out of the five? So every other day you're running or doing jujitsu. So you're starting to implement skill sets and some combative cardio in there along with that too. So can jujitsu play a huge part in police work? Sure. How's that going to happen? Uh, integration of legislation. And then, you know, like what we do at EFC is we have a baseline 40-hour uh, curriculum. And then we have a level two, which is based on more like uh, tactics that go around stress, okay, decision-making around stress. Okay. But we also have uh, a certified academy, which is community gyms, jujitsu gyms, want to say, hey, I'm a black belt and I have a lot of cops here. I want to teach a lot of cops, but I don't have the police experience. I don't get the integration. Um, they can partner with EFC, uh, become a certified EFC academy. They go through the instructor school. They get the videos. Uh, they get everything. And then we give them a 26-week layout. Hey, I would do if I have one class an hour a week or I'm doing two classes, this is what I would teach for that hour this week. And it basically runs the same width of our, like the same order of our curriculum. And then it integrates all those things in. Um, so we, we have, you know, quite a few now, we just started that program probably, uh, I would say within like the last year somewhere in that last year, we started that certified Academy and we already have a ton of academies that are implementing the EFC program into it for their cops. So whether they teach it just Saturdays or maybe they teach it Tuesday night and Saturday morning, or, you know, to vary for schedule differences. But now those guys that want to go to those gyms, if you're a cop and you're really want to do jujitsu but you want more of a combatives program too now they're going to get both at these gyms sure or they okay. at least get an instructor that understands the differences between between the two right we know jujitsu the primary function is give us a skill set make us uncomfortable good lifestyle but then how do we bridge that gap between what we do in jujitsu and what we do in police work okay i want to uh, christian let's uh let's put up that video i wanted to uh I came across this and I messaged it to you. I said I wanted to break this down. Do you know these guys at all? You, uh, I don't you know, know the, the other guy uh, personally. I know uh, Brad. Brad's uh, 
a, a very good, very good human being. Uh, good black belt. He owns Midland uh, Jiu Jitsu, I think, in okay. Midland, Texas. Uh, he also uh, teaches combatives for um, C4C. He's a very good dude. Okay, let's uh, let's let this play, and then we'll talk about it. If I like to shoot, I'm going to shoot. If I like to grapple, I'm going to roll. If I like to strike, I'm going to work on my striking. One tool I've yet to use. I've I've never deployed a stick. I don't think I've even ever pepper sprayed. I've pepper sprayed a lot of officers. In training. But we also have a bad habit of doing what we like to do. Absolutely. So if I like to shoot, I'm going to shoot. If I like to grapple, I'm going to roll. If I like to strike, I'm going to work on my striking. One tool I've yet to use, I've, I've never deployed a stick. I don't think I've even ever pepper sprayed. I've pepper right, sprayed that, a lot was that, that was the whole thing, right? It just replayed. Yep. So so he's talking about, right, he's talking about on the job, right? I'm, if I like if I'm a, somebody who's always practicing shooting, I'm going to defer to the gun, right? If I'm a grappler, right, we're talking about I have the confidence to grapple and, and you know, de-escalate, right? What, what do you think about what he's saying? I, you know, how true is that? So it, it's, it's, scary, it's scary on the shooting side. It, like a guy that's always at the yes. range is like, oh, shit, this guy's the yeah. guy that's going to, you know. Sh-. It's scary. Uh, and, and the problem is, is that, that's why we call ourselves a combatives company. Mm-hmm. We're not a DT company. And the reason being is your gun problem can become a hands-on problem right away. Your hands-on problem can become a gun problem, a stick problem, a taser Mm -hmm. problem at any time. So if I'm not training the combatives environment, I'm only going to be good. It's it's human nature. Look at MMA. You're right. MMA's changed the game. So it's if you got the jujitsu world champion that sucks at wrestling and striking, and he goes against a guy that's good at wrestling and striking, the jujitsu guy can't take him to the ground and he's not striking good, who's going to most likely win that fight? And that's yeah. just a mistake making, right? Yeah. So understanding that in police work, you have to be well-rounded. When I first started, and still now in most most agencies, you have the DT guys over here. You have the range guys over here, okay? Well, I'm a range guy. I don't need DT training. I don't need to grapple. I have a gun. Okay, well, and realistically, in use of force situations, your gun is probably used 0.02 times in all incidents across the country on a daily basis. That might be high. Okay. okay. So now maybe your gun is out and more often and used as uh, de-escalation. Hey, I have you at gunpoint. I'm calling you guys out of the car. You're like, okay, more cooperative. And it ends peacefully way more often than not. Okay. Mm-hmm. We don't see those ones because sure. it's boring. Yeah. Okay. But um, understanding that they have to come full circle. I may have my gun out. And I may not be now in the force level to 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 shoot you. And then I have to hold certain, can I go to another tool? Can I go to hands-on? Uh, if I rely on taser, it's probably because my hands-on skills are poor. You know, so having those hands-on skills, we t- I, I, this is how I explain it in class. I want you guys to leave here knowing that you should be hands-on and verbal dependent, okay? And your belt is supporting that, those skills. Okay. Instead of being tool dependent and then having no answer besides that. Sure. Because now now you're gonna make bad decisions that it's gonna actually like increase your level of force if they don't listen to you. So understanding the hands-on skill portion is so important because of that. On top of that, though, in the police, we have to have a a, a way to build skill also that can bridge the gap between all the other options that might occur or might happen. I've seen guys go hands-on too long because they have really good hands-on skills or go hands-on when they might not have tactically gone hands-on and they got lucky or they didn't get lucky, right? And so can there be certain scenarios where, hey, I'm going to be too confident in my hands-on skills? Well, you're working in an environment where you, you may have weapons involved. You guys may be trying to kill you or somebody else. So we have to understand that, yeah, you're going to have your bread and butter. Like me, jujitsu is my bread and butter. Sure. But I ha- I also can shoot really well. Right? I also trained transitioning from one weapon to the next weapon, holstering without looking at my holster, holstering my taser. With a, so I know maybe I drop the taser and go to my have to go to my handgun on a deadly physical force situation. Maybe I, you know, so you got to have all these different instances where you train these things. And that's the big part that sometimes, again, we love jujitsu. We think it's overall going to make everybody at the highest percentage better in, in the, the profession of policing. But you also have to have something that bridges the gap between the rest of all the options in police work, right? Jiu-jitsu for sure is going to lower costs in departments as far as 
officer and suspect injury, not just the officer, but the suspects too. We're going to lower that injury rate. We're not going to have our batons out hitting, kicking, smacking him. We're not going to be tasing people all the time. Um, we're we're going to be using takedowns, control tactics, okay? Uh, we don't need to punch him in the face to get his hands behind his back. We know the formula for extracting arms, okay? So now all your officer injury is down, which means your lawsuits are going to be down from that those aspects. And then uh, your use of force violations and suing people for either wrongful death or overuse of force is going to be way down. So, okay, maybe one or two injure, one or two officers get injured um, every every year or every two years. I guarantee you more in, officers get injured doing something else. More officers get injured on the job because they don't know how to fight or they don't know how to do jujitsu, right? So that is an excuse. It's a okay. simple excuse. It, are there cues from the military the way that, you know, the military, the, the continuing edu education side of the military or the PT side? Do you think that there are cues that police departments can take from the military on how they're, you know, keeping their soldiers in shape? Or is that is that overkill? Just that side, just the PT side. I'm not talking about everything else. Just that PT side of like, you know, you... I don't want to say we should be like militarized the, the police department by any by any means, but just that that the PT side, you you know you're always you've always got to be in good shape. I feel like that's what's lacking. You know, going back to what I said before, like it has to be constant. But are there cues that we can take from the way the military does that side of things? I don't think the military varies much from the police world on the civilian okay. side, the civilian police world. And here's my experience: I was never in the military. Okay, my dad was in the military for a significantly long time. I have a lot of good friends in the military. My cadre alone has guys that are currently in the military now that are also police officers. Okay, um, In police work, your SWAT teams, your specialized units get extra training all the time. They're training more continuously. Okay? Same with the military, your SF guys, your specialized units. The average military guys after camp are in no better shape really? okay. than the police officers. Okay. Uh, and the only reason I know that is because I've I've taught military units, and okay. whether they're full time guys or they're reservists, they're just regular infantry, they're whatever. That they're they may be in a little bit better shape, but it's not a significant difference. What we do good in our profession is we make sure our specialized units train a lot, and we give them all the money. And then your basic patrol, like your basic infantry, infantry those guys get nothing. Like they don't get what those units do. But yet they're the meat and potatoes of what I'm probably thinking when I'm do. saying even the military side, I'm probably thinking more of like, you know, you see like the SEALs training and things like that in the team, yeah. right? You would call the teams or special operators. I mean, those guys yeah. are right. Their job is to, to get good at this stuff, right? right. Their, their job is to be in shape and Correct. to be, you know, training. Take, you know. Your, take your full-time SWAT teams. That's yeah. what they're doing too. Yeah. They're working out every okay. day. If okay. they don't have an op or they're not uh, building for a brief or they're not doing um, something for some sort of mission coming up then they're working out, they're training every day. Okay. Uh, there's a Baldwin study out there. It's called the Baldwin study. Uh, it's, it's not too old. And it took um, a bunch of special unit operators, uh, special unit uh, police, like police, civilian policing SWAT uh, operators versus just regular basic patrol difference and experience and put them through um, what we call like box drills or like scenarios where they don't know what the scenario is. They just have to react to it. And... It was like seventy four percent of this of the like special details unit or the special detail guys, the SWAT guys, were performing at like seventy four percent in these versus the average patrol ones were around fifty. Right. So we understand that more training, that study alone shows you guys that are training more are having a higher success rate. Their performance is at seventy four, seventy five percent. So three fourths of the time they're having good performance versus one half that's a that's a big difference so are you going into departments and like like doing a presentation to convince a department i mean is i in the beginning when you started was it like i've got to convince somebody versus now are they coming to you being like hey we heard about you guys and we, we'd like you to come in has that has that shifted for you it's both still yeah um we I mean, are, are you, uh, do I, are you going in doing like a PowerPoint like this is, you know, like, do you have to do those so kind of presentations? I do those at conferences. I just did it at Calfia at the symposium out there. Okay. Um, and it's eye opening to people. Cause I come in with, with stats and statistics and, and sure data can be, uh, tweaked one way or the other to sure. show whatever yeah. you're doing. But 
when you have like one slide I, I used, your dad was an NYPD guy, was like uh, quarter one, quarter two stats. Okay. Hands on physical tactics were used somewhere around, I think it was like 1,900 times in quarter one. The next highest form of use of force was electrical weapon, the taser, okay, which was used somewhere like 350. Okay. And then like shooting was like 10 or 11. So like we are clearly going hands on way more than we're doing anything else in police work when it comes to use of force and resisting arrest. Okay? Quarter two was even higher. It was like 2,100 and some for hands on versus like 14 or 15 with your handgun and then maybe 400 and some with the electrical weapons. So again, the next highest is taser and it's at 400 and some versus 2,100 hands on uh, cases of, of resisting arrest that was solved with the use of force, but we're not giving these guys any tools to get better and we're not training them continuously with our hands on. So that's why it's so important in what we do. There's, I categorize it in like four levels of force for like civilians and even for police officers. You have the passive resistant guy. He's not fighting you. He's not even trying to resist you. Basically you're going to grab hold of him and put his hands behind his back. He's, he's mm -hmm. going, he, he's going to be in custody. Sure. Then you have the guy that's actively resisting. You're not trying to hurt me. You're not kicking me. You're not punching me. You're just not letting me get you into custody. That's the overwhelming person that we deal with. That is our overwhelming person that we deal with in police work. Like they almost feel like they're going to convince you like, no, 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 you're not taking yeah. me to jail today. <laughs> right. Or they just, they just, they don't want to go to jail and they're just fighting it, but they, they know better than to like attack you or hurt sure. you. Sure. Okay? Or they just don't, maybe they don't want to hurt you, right? Maybe they're just trying not to go to jail. Then you have the guy that's actively combative towards you, right? And then you have the guy that's trying to actually kill you. So, like, understand those are the four main people that we, we use force on, okay? Um, obviously, you have some mental health issues and some other things in, in, that you deal with, too. But uh, that overwhelming one is just actively resisting. And we see so much, like, issues with it because we just don't know how to control the human body. We don't understand the anatomy. We don't understand where we control points are on the human body and how to do it. And jujitsu solves a lot of those issues. Absolutely. And then integrate it with a little bit of weapons and environment. And, and now people are going to understand, like at my department, we started implementing training. Um, first, it was like uh, twice a year and then it was four times a year. And all I would concentrate on in the beginning was one man tactics, one man takedowns and then team tactics. Were you part of that in your department? Yeah. Were you, were so you part I, of the. Yep. So the, uh, our chief at the time. Um, was a big wrestler military guy and he's like he came to me he's like hey i want you to revamp our program and we're going to train it more continuously okay and i want you i don't care what the state's doing so that's how i started doing that's how the state become aware of what we're doing and there are guys at our department like i was i was pretty lucky like our we started to create a culture where a lot of guys were training either whether they're high level wrestlers they're training jujitsu they're training like at one point our entire SWAT team was training about like three guys i think or had some sort of training background, right? So, but the Russell Patrol is just competent. We built an SOP, uh, you know, standard operating procedure for team tactics. That means two officers or more taking someone into custody. So everyone had a plan. Everyone was disciplined in that plan and we all knew the communication. So then you take guys that just train that four or five times a year. Now, if you and I get into an, a fight with someone and I'm high, you know where to go. You're not fighting me. We're not fighting each other. We see these what we call pig piles on the mm -hmm. street. Mm -hmm. No, Nobody's working together. Everybody's doing things. So now it's like, okay, you're if I'm high, you're you're dedicated low. You're anchoring that dude's legs, right? And then the second guy is going to come in, or the, the third guy will come in, and he'll, he'll post on the head. Now we've pinned the head and we've pinned the legs. So I'm in the middle of the body. I'm just got to worry about working the arms and making sure they're not presenting anything. It takes all the responsibilities away. If I'm by myself, I have to control your hips, I gotta control your legs, I gotta mm, control your head, yeah. I gotta watch what your hands are doing. So I have a lot more responsibilities. So we take competent cops that don't train jujitsu, but are competent in the system, and it's just like clockwork. Sure. Uh, one of my buddies sent me um, a video of them the other night, and it's he can't release it just because it's still new and there's just an arrest, but uh, there's three of them. And we talk about it's like the power of the low anchor, and that's securing that guy's legs. When you got a guy on, on the torso, whether it's knee on top position, back mount, low crab ride, whatever it might be, and you figure for someone's legs, like it's super difficult. Like um, I'm a black belt, and like when we do these with like simunitions where like it's like it's like uh, 
training guns that shoot like a, a paintball, but they hurt. Like yeah. they're, um, I'll have three guys. One is a cover guy and then two guys. And these guys start to staple my limbs. They start to make my ability to present. They take that away first. They start to control me. I'm trying to invert to get to my weapons and I'm inverted, completely inverted, trying to get to my weapons and I can't. And I'm like, this is what we're doing right. Yeah. Right. As a black belt, I'm trying to invert with three guys or I'm trying to fight three guys and I can't get, to, I had a handgun that had some munitions in it. And then I had a, a shock knife in there too. Now yeah. I, I wanted to shoot them and shock them for the train. I was like, I wanted to. a shock knife. Yeah. Yeah. So uh-huh. I was trying to get to them and I couldn't get to them because between the three, they, they, crushed my limbs like one stapled this arm i started to reach the other guy stapled that arm now my limbs are stapled down i got someone controlling my legs and someone posting on my head mm. you said you you mentioned your uh your cap was it a captain or uh, chief? it was the chief the, the wrestler police. yeah is, is that what it's going to take to get people yeah. that do understand combatives into those positions of power that then just keep on expanding because yeah. it's really hard to somebody that doesn't know that's been on the job for 20 years and has never yeah. had to do a combatives course yeah. It's hard for them if they don't see it. They 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 might they might see it, but they don't realize because they never did it. Like as soon as you step on the jujitsu mat, you're like, most people are like, oh shit, I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. And it's, it's like really humbling and eye opening. You're like, holy shit, man, this woman, yep. smaller guy, and you know, it opens up. Yeah. I I can instances of of girls in our gym rolling with somebody that was new, and the guys just like. But what's happening here? <laughs> this girl is kicking my ass. Exactly. Is is that what it takes? It is does. to get those guys? It's, it's kind of like aging out, right? Right. So the, all these guys that you've been working with, they're getting into positions of power, and then just expand these Correct. these things. You you mentioned before. You said um, you started doing things on the local level, and then the, the state took notice. Mm-hmm. Um, it could it have gone either way? Like, hey, you need to stop doing this. You well, know, could did, did, could it happen that way? Well, not really. You, were you guys like, lucky? That they were like, hey, we like this. Well, so in New York, you're a certified agency or not a certified agency. Mm -hmm. We're a certified agency, so, like, we have to go by certain rules that the state tells Mm -hmm. us to do. But that's just the minimum curriculum. So anything you do above and beyond that, they're not going to tell you not to do it unless it's, like, completely detrimental. Um, But, like, you know, the what they're teaching in the academy then wasn't even a curriculum. It was just like a whole bunch of different moves for different things in different positions, right? So, like, they see the effectiveness of it. Like, yeah. when people – I have to sell the course right now for people to come to the course. I don't ever have to sell it to them once they've been in the course. Yeah. yeah I'll like, ask when them, are you coming back? When are you, you – know. Yeah, or, they'll, you know, they have to oh. reset. Our, our instructors have to reset because we want them to continue to come back. Industry standards around uh, two to three years, depending on what, what it is, taser, DT – um, those things to research as far as keeping up on your skills. But like we we want our guys to get so good at level one that that's all you really need every time out there as far as like custody and control. I mean, you know, 14 to 15 of my years in police work utilizing those skills and never had an issue. Like everything was so much better, so much solved, you know, it's solved much easier. Um, I wanted to push it out to everybody else. I didn't start training jujitsu until after I started working. Right, and I had a couple incidents. I was like, "Man, I got lucky there. I got yeah. learn how to fight." <laughs> Do you now? Even you, you said you retired. You, yeah, you're one I retired retire? in April. Yeah. Um, even before you retired, were you okay? You're doing your combative side. Do you just go for a normal role with like you know, with guys at the gym? Are you are you always focused on the combatives, or are you doing a regular role like a sport type of jujitsu, like what I do? Are you go in like your seven thirty class, and it's an hour of you know uh, instruction, and then and then rolling. Are you still doing that, yeah. or is it always centered around just the combative side, or, or what would be applicable for for the, you know LEO? I would say I, I train sport jujitsu and wrestling uh, probably on average four to five days a week. And then I train and teach so much now that I'm demoing and, and jumping in on roles and uh, teaching like reality based training, which would be like our pressure testing mm-hmm. uh, with Sims and stuff. Um, probably somewhere between once, twice a week, um, maybe once every two weeks, getting in those types of roles or at least a few goes that way just to stay mm-hmm. sharp on it now that I'm not working. When I was in the street, um, all the units I had worked for, um, even when I was on patrol, super pro- proactive, like, Foot pursuits, uh, resisting arrests on the daily, if not minimal, multiple times a week. That was keeping me sharp in those environments. Yeah. 
Um, and then we pressure test some of the stuff. But when you say pressure test, you're like, hey, I, I, we should try this. Like, try this move, and then, right, you have somebody resisting to figure out, like, how this should work. Should we use it? Should we not? Or it needs to be done this way, right? You're almost like we were, like, jujitsu is always evolving with new moves. Is that what you're kind of saying? That pressure testing are new moves or new ways to. So this to, is you like know. you throwing me out. A slow pitch softball up in the air because this is one okay. of my favorite questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are so many forms of pressure testing in the police world, okay, and combatants world, and that could be just minimal resistance, like level one, minimal resistance. I want you just to show me struggle. Maybe it's just touch strikes. Okay. Maybe we don't have belts on. I'm just trying to get up off the back. That's minimal pressure testing. Okay. Then we could add in gun belts like some cert guns, which actually show the dots of where you could be hitting, um, but it's not shooting a projectile. Add MMA gloves, headgear, where you can add in strikes now. We're going to do more of like a, a full resistance spar with training gun, rubber knife, whatever. Okay. Then the highest form of pressure testing we can do in the law enforcement environment is, in the training environment, is simunition or UTM. It shoots a projectile. It hurts. Uh some sort of shock knife, um, red beard competitive helmets with the hood so we can get no contacts on those shots. And we're going to have like two ounce gloves on so we can throw freaking punches and kicks. And we're going to go at it. You and I are going to go like and, and see what okay. happens. And, and I might not know. As a safety guy, I could give you a concealed gun, a concealed knife. Maybe I give you a, and you don't know. Maybe I give you a cell phone. I don't know what you have. Oh, wow. Okay. Then I turn around and he says, okay, you get an underhook key. We just start in a pummeling position and it's a go. Maybe he says, okay, I want you to start knee on top, and we're going to go, right? And it ends in you're in custody or some sort of force is used, or maybe you you get something and you hurt I kill me. you. Yeah. Right, yeah. right? So that's the highest form of pressure testing we can do in the training environment. The highest form of pressure testing is when we do it in the streets with our gun belts on, taking live people, real resistant people into custody in that environment, right? So that's why, like, Another reason I think EFC blows up so much is my body worn camera gets put out there and people are like, everything he's teaching, he's doing exactly what he teaches on the street against fully combative people that are carrying weapons, not carrying weapons in a, in a road against a car, like all that other stuff. So that's the highest form. And now it doesn't have to be me. I could teach you. And now you go out and utilize that and you give me the feedback. Hey, he used this on the street. That's real pressure testing, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people will be like, hey, I pressure tested it. And I'll be like, how? How? <laughs> At what level? Yeah. Right? Because there's there's a My difference. son in the garage, we were playing with this, right? <laughs> exactly. Now, do we do things on the street where like, hey, I go to this situation and it worked out. I got lucky, but I'm like, let's roll this back in. We got to find a better way of this because it could have gone bad. Mm -hmm. could have gone wrong. Is there a different way to do it? Of course. We pressure test like that all the time, especially as a cadre. Like, if you look at my cadre and my, my instructors and police... Like, they all have law enforcement experience, and they're all brown or black belts, uh, with the exception of Jade. She's a female. She's purple belt. She's trained with Vitor Oliveira, and she's a, uh, a pro fighter, and her dad, Scott Sleazy, who's a professional kickboxer. She's my only purple belt, right? She and, sounds qualified. And she's a cop. Okay? <laughs> so um, everybody else is a brown or black belt. And then I have guys like Matt Secor. He just went 3-1 and one at East Coast Trials, right? He lost to Devontae Johnson, um, uh, I think, on points maybe. You know, and, and that was just strategy. He pulled he he pulled the half guard on on Devante. Like, well, that dude's huge. But Matt's a freaking beast, right? Yeah. He's an ultimate fighter. Like Manny Velasquez, he just was the number one seed in the uh, EBI Combat Worlds in July. You know, Dylan Royce, he's probably he's Masters one, probably top five gi and no gi guy. These um, are all your guys. These are the, all guys. They're that... all cops, and they yeah. all are my my yeah. instructors. Oh wow! Right, so like, um, guys that are teaching for us have. Police, tactical experience, and our high level, like jujitsu jiu guys, yeah, guys, right. So like, um, I can't even explain how happy I am for that cadre because like, I'll take Brendan and Andrew for example. They're current full time SWAT guys and current black belts, right? So now not only are they black belts in jujitsu, they're training full time as SWAT tactical officers also. So now imagine the experience they bring to the class, right? So they're, they're merged, and that's what I wanted my cadre to be built off of. It's not just about Jay Wadsworth, right? It's about mm. what is the team you put around you, you know? 
coming up too. It was just like, hey, I learned all this stuff myself. No, I surrounded myself with really good people coming up too, different groups that I'm, I I worked for or or currently deal with those types of things. Like, it's not just a one man show. Yes, my brain works that way. So it's like the way I write curriculum and integrate it is is important because like people don't see it at different angles and how to integrate all those skills, right? But it's important to build that team around you. And I'm building a team that is all the guys on my team are that jiu-jitsu lifestyle, okay? Or high level freaking wrestlers that are collegiate wrestlers, yeah. you know? And that, so everyone's got some grappling like accolades high and then they have law enforcement experience because bridging the gap is only done with experience. I don't care what anyone says, until you have that experience, it's very difficult. Now, could you as a brown belt come over and train in my system five, six, seven times, eight times, nine times, ten times, and be like, okay, I don't have the police experience, but I've trained in this curriculum so much now, I understand why they teach it this way mm -hmm. and be able to teach it? Of course you could. Or understand it? Yes. That that's the that's the part about retaining it. What's students' retainment level? How do I build in the most reps in jujitsu? I did this wrong. I always tell people, uh, I want you guys to understand too that like you guys can make mistakes and then teach off those mistakes rather than just teaching off what you've done good. Okay. When I first started doing the jujitsu for police stuff, I'd start out in mount, you worst position, defend mount, okay, then side control, then half guard, then guard, then open guard. Okay. What is wrong with that? I mean, it's never going to happen like that. It's You're never going to... When you say it like that, yeah, like, I just... In, in a real-world situation, you're just not going to be there. It's We're going to probably start on our feet, right? Mm -hmm. So it's... You've got to kind of understand all of the, the aspects of not only being on your feet, but then when you're falling to the ground and... In and between then, now and then. Yeah. So if you're in mount, if I mount you, unless you trap and roll me, when you escape mount, what's one of the most common positions you end up in? I mean, I go for a half guard. Yeah, so you go from mount to half guard. But if I don't teach you half guard, then you don't know what to do with it. So now yeah. you escape mount, you went to half guard, you stop, you you're no up, you're done. Do. Yeah. But in police work, where do you want to get to? On top or to your feet? So now that reps over. But you haven't really achieved only bettering your position. Okay? So I teach open guard backwards now through mount. Okay. Then when I get to mount, your drill and rep isn't over until you're on your feet or on top. So now you go from mount to half guard. Okay, now wrestle up or sweep and get on top or stand up. Then your rep's over. So now I built in what you did blocks prior into your drill from the mount. Same with takedowns versus ground control. I used to take teach the takedowns first. Simple, right? Hey, we're all, all fights start on our feet. Let's take takedowns. You take me down. Do you know where I want you to go in police work? You don't. You don't know what positions I want you to go into. So now you're going to continue to go to the positions that you are good in for sport jujitsu, or you're not skilled, you learn to take down and you have no idea where to go. So you go to some old uh, DT level thing that you and I look at and we're cringing, or they just take it down, stop and go back. If I teach people the ground system first, where I want you to go for control to custody first, then the next block is you do takedowns. You already end in that position. So if I take you down, I let you go right before we hit the ground because I don't want to stay connected to you. I don't know what I'm taking you down on. And then I move to a leg drag or a knee on top. Now I get more reps of leg drag, knee on top that I did the reps before. So how do I build in more reps for retainment is that way. And, and it took me a while to learn that. That wasn't how the system always was. But I was seeing the retainment in those certain positions hard or me going and having to be like, hey, you're half guard. Now you could have these options, but they don't know where to go. And I was like, I'm teaching this backwards. If I teach it the other way, they're going to get all these reps and get to do all those reps again. So if you did okay. 20 half guard sweeps or 20 half guard wrestle ups, and then now you do mount escape and you get to half guard and you do the mount escape and get to half guard 10 more times, you get 10 more half guard reps of sweeping or getting at your feet. Gotcha. And that's just how you build that retainment. Okay. So it's been I working got, really well. Let's jump into some of these questions because some of these questions are going to, we might come back on some of these i might i might skip some of the ones we spoke about already but i'm going to just go top down here we had a, we had a ton of questions and uh, again i'm sure some of these guys know you too uh so this is uh, uh terry chua 
Uh, I, Sound familiar? Yep. Uh, many claim that the streets have no rules. We kind of talked about this a little bit. Therefore, belittling combat sports training. What is your take on this statement for law enforcement training? We should never belittle combat sports training because it's going to yeah. give us the skill set and the mindset to always be able to win and fight. Okay, We just have to find a bridge in between what that skill set does for us and how to integrate it into the police environment. Right, there's the always that one idiot that's like, that yeah. would never work in, you know, a real fight right. or, you know, for, for again, for law yeah. enforcement. So but... I think the biggest thing is, hey, always, always do jujitsu, wrestling, Muay Thai, some sort of MMA, combat sports, because they're going to build your skill sets. They're going to give you that lifestyle, that, that card, combat cardio. And then, hey, EFC or, or, or a program can for sure bridge that gap. If you're with the right people. And just because, let's say, the streets have no rules, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be trained, right? You want yeah. so to we... limit the things that could happen, right? Yeah, there's always that, you know, somebody can come driving, a, a friend could drive a car down the street and hit you or something, something crazy. But you want to train for every possible situation that, that you can. What's right? the alternative? Be an unskilled person on the street fighting? Yeah. Still? Like, the, yeah. The, the alternative that is, when we hear that, it's like, hey, tell me you don't train without telling me you don't train. Yeah. Is yeah. What goes to my head every time I see that comment. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I have to like hold myself back from like. <laughs> I had somebody comment. We very rarely get any negative comments and somebody commented on a, on a recent episode. And I usually, the first thing I usually do or, or pretty quickly, I'm usually say, well, what rank are you? You know, so I understand who I'm talking to. So somebody would, you know, he was saying something nice. He said he wound up saying he was a purple belt. And I was like, oh, so you're relatively new still. <laughs> it's not, but I kind of threw that out. So this is relatively new still. So you're still learning kind of like this environment. And, and and he stopped, you know, messaging. He wasn't being disrespectful, but he was, you know, he wasn't being super nice either. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's usually like the people that say this don't don't know. They don't know. They've never trained or they, you know, they watch some videos or they watch the UFC and right. Um, I, when I first went to train, I had wrestled a little in junior high. When I first went to my first day of training jujitsu, I threw hands. I always had a punching bag in the house and I did a little bit of, uh, like stand up and Muay Thai a little bit, a few months here and there, like start and stop. And my, the, my coach who was a family friend, he said, so, you know, what do you know? And I said, well, you know, again, I did a little wrestling and I go, I watch a ton of UFC. He laughed at me and he's like, come on. Again, I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. And, I, you know, that was my go-to answer. I'm like, I see this stuff all the time. I'm such a huge fan. I kind of know. And, and then you realize what you don't know, you know, almost, you know, nine and a half years later. I try to solve a lot of those with DMs. Yeah. Hey, what is your suggestion? Yeah. Why do you think this? Yeah. And then I try to educate them nicely. And if they don't, then the conversation's over. It's yeah. fine. Like, yeah. You know, I'm getting better at that rather than like arguing. Like the, the internet's undefeated. You're never going to win an argument. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for you know, it's, when it's like this was on uh, on the YouTube. So like, I'll I, I don't usually entertain it much at all. But it was on like a YouTube, and, and you know, I just yeah, yeah I had time, and yeah. I was like, I started. I'm usually more of like like let other people answer it, and I'll let other people get into it. I'm That's not always gonna, good when your your fan base answers a question because you're gonna them. get you. It's you know, it's it's difficult enough just you know having basically two jobs like I have, right? You know, I'm sure you did too, right? You're yeah. on the job and you're doing this, right? Yeah. It's hard enough to then get into a conversation with some idiot that doesn't know what he's talking about. Correct. But anyway, all right, so we'll go to the next one. This is on from Instagram. Uh, the handle's Center Fed Gang. Uh, what have you found to be the most effective way to get officers to attend weekly BJJ and DT training uh, being offered at the police department? So what I start doing there is, I don't train just sport jujitsu with those. I start to integrate in more of the EFC curriculum skill building drills and have the objective lead to like what is our end goal in police work? End with knee on top, end with an arm extraction, um, leg drag position. Great for jujitsu, right? Sure. Amazing control on the street. My gun belt's behind him. He can't hold me down. I can lead the fight. I can better my position. You know, so I, I'll try to always stick to the fundamental skills of jujitsu and then integrate it into what is our end goal as far as control and custody. Okay. And that really helps guys get in there. And the more they start getting in there and you get those guys that group in there and then they want to do more sport jujitsu, you can integrate more sport jujitsu into that too. All you're doing is building their skills, right? Jujitsu builds skills. That's what it does. It gives us a mm. skill set to do multiple other things. Now, now my skills here versus down here. 
but I just need that fundamental skill set. Going back to what we were saying before, do I don't know if we we answered it like this or if you address it like this when we talked about the like the guy, well the video, like guys oh, that yeah. are shooters are going to shoot. Mm -hmm. Do you did you encounter that? Like I don't need oh, that. Yeah. Like did you mm -hmm. on the job yourself? Ah, I'm not, I got you know I got my gun. You what know that highest form of pressure testing what? that we we're talking about on the in, street? Yeah, in, actually the one in the training environment now oh, on okay. the Sims. I'm going to be unarmed. You're going to have a gun. Maybe have a knife. Maybe have a gun. You don't know. We're going to fight in a confined space. You're a gun guy. It's not easy to get your gun out of the holster, get your gun up and present it on someone without, one, me taking it. I always take their gun and I shoot them with it. That's eye-opening to them. Yeah. You're a gun guy. You only need a gun. Or, but they're not they're not learning the retention side of it, which is what they don't realize, right? They they, don't they're realize. great with the gun yes. and accuracy. Right. At space. And presenting and quickly, maybe, but yeah. not, right, yeah. So now it's, in, in, in the, the police world, the tactics world, military world, it's distance equals time. Distance gives us time for better That's tactics, like, better decision-making. Right? Yeah. Control also gives us time mm -hmm. for better decision-making. If you know how to control a guy and you have you know, a knee on top, back mount, you have an arm, double underhooks, wrist control, He's not going anywhere. You have time. You can disengage if you need to. You're dominating position. You're going to make better decisions under stress. So control is in the control world is like distance in the tactics world, right? They both equal time to make better decisions. Wow. Good stuff, man. All right. So we have, uh, this is Russ Jav, J-A-V. What are the best coaching or teaching strategies to get cops who resist training on board? How do you actually get them through the door? So... Mm -hmm. You got it, it, it's going to be a trickle down, but what you if you can just invite them there and don't overwhelm them, just start out with simple skill building, start out on their feet too, because the ground is a whole nother world that takes people out of their element, right? Like if you took the lion and you put him in the middle of the ocean, the shark wins. If you take the shark, drag him up on the beach, the lion probably wins a fight, right? So these guys are all the way already reluctant. The last thing we need to do is beat them. Yeah. Now, if they want to see the difference and you want to do a pressure testing drill with them, they're going to learn. But then then back it off and be like, hey, we don't need to teach you to be a black belt. They're all worried about, I'm not going to be competing and be a black belt. No, but I need to get you the competent skills of a jiu-jitsu person, wrestling person, so that you can be safe and good at your job. Right. So mm -hmm. bringing them in and baby stepping how you do. Don't just throw them into guard on their back and like start smashing them or doing drills. Start out with just solo drills, hip escaping. Okay, mm -hmm. hip escaping down. That's a premier skill you need for working off your back. If you don't have that, you're just getting up, doing regular get-ups. Talk about underhooks, frames, inside head positions. All those things slowly. Then they're coming in. They're not thinking they're learning just jujitsu. You're, like, tricking them into learning, like, skills yeah. that are building into jujitsu. It's almost like you trick kids, like, when uh, yeah. they play jujitsu, uh, to play jujitsu, yeah. or when they play games at the end of class, they don't realize, like, the crab walking yes. that they're doing with the little polo yep. game that they might be playing, like they're learning a skill and they're, right. they're getting good at it. And I know for me, like I'm always telling, I understand the business side of the jujitsu, the jujitsu world. Like I understand my coach, it's still a business. Mm -hmm. It may be his passion, but it's still a business. So I'm always telling like white belt or uh, when a new white belt comes in and you know, the, the white belts that have been around for a little bit, or maybe the new blue belts are like really beating up on that guy. They're like fresh meat. Finally, somebody I'm going to beat. I'm like, guys, you got to remember, mm -hmm. remember what it was like for you. And we want, you know, yes, you want to hone your skills, but we want this guy to be comfortable and come back. And again, not only for him, because we want to further jujitsu, but for our coach, it's still his business. So I'm always telling guys like, take it easy, yeah. you know, maybe work on a Like a guy that's just maybe we, our guys roll pretty quickly. Maybe they don't roll the first or second day, but first week they're, they're rolling. I know a lot of schools will say they're Ours not going to roll for a long time. Summer, yeah. so they're, they're rolling, but I'll usually tell like, Especially if they're bigger, I'll use the up. Okay, come on. Yep. And then no matter what everybody's doing, I'm going to say, okay, let's do jujitsu 101, get in my guard, escape, side control, things like that. But I try to tell my other guys, like, not my school, but, you know, my, my buddy's like, hey, take it easy on the guy. The guy's freaking new. We got one guy, we got a purple belt who loves to wrist lock brand new white belts. You know, so, we're like, <laughs> dude, come on, you can't do that. You already you know, know you're going to wrist lock him. Yeah, you know. Uh, they're just, they're not going to come back. You're going to, or they're going to go to another school. Yeah. So the other, um, the other yeah. thing with that is I, I would urge them to add in team tactics right away. Yeah. So start training, especially if the PD is holding these judicial, start training where you have two or three officers on one person and work in control there. 
because then they're going to see how beneficial that is compared to what it is before. And if you can show them that it's beneficial to their job or to their like life, they start seeing it quicker. Or like, oh, I don't need to learn jujitsu because I'm not going to be good at this. I, you know, and, and then they almost like shun it off. Where like we have to show them the aspects of where it helps their job, because we all know that jujitsu is a lifestyle. And no matter how much you train, it's going to better your lifestyle, right? But we can't explain that to them. They just don't know and they don't want to know. So we have to find those different ways to relate it back to the job first and then integrate further yeah. into the, the jujitsu. The most annoying thing, jujitsu, or even in my personal life, I know my, my stepdaughter used to do this all the time. Um, she would say something like, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to be good at that. Or mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that, so yeah. I'm not even going to try. And I'd be like, you understand there was a point where you didn't know how to walk, you didn't know how to talk, you didn't know how to crawl, you didn't know how to eat. And you learned all of those things by doing. I mean, that's the same thing that you're going to do here. Exactly. And if there were times in, in situations where I could actually get her to do something, it was almost always like, it's never as bad as you think it's going to be, right? It's, it's almost not, never. Yeah. It's like, wow, I really got something out of this. Yeah. Like, there's something to be said for all these guys rolling around on the mat. But I, it, it was one of the things that annoyed me the most about her and my and her mom um, were that it they they didn't like to try new things like that. Like I could never. I had mats in my garage, punching bag. My wife did a little kickboxing. Um, she went in there like one time. Yeah. And but she'll go to her gym and do it, but she wouldn't go in there. And I just tell like you have a brown belt in jujitsu. Your, your your daughter's about to go to college. She had knows. She in no way, shape, or form knows how to protect herself. Other than me telling her, well, at least like knee him in the balls, you know, to, if, if you ever get attacked, she would, they would not, because they're like, I don't want to do that. I'm not, I don't want somebody sweating. I'm, I'm not telling you to go to a class. I'm like, let's go in, yeah, we'll try let's go in the one. garage and let, let me just show you some basics. They were like, so anti learning something new like that. So drove me nuts. I'm lucky because my daughter's 18. She's a freshman in college this year. Uh, she's a blue belt. Um, her skill level is much higher than that. She got her blue belt when she turned 16. Uh, she wrestled for four years for the boys' varsity team uh, as a starter. So, like, wow. she she got a lot of matches in. And, you know, so I'm, like, confident when she's at college. Like, hey, she knows how to defend herself, yeah. right? Whereas my 16-year-old trained for a little while but is just reluctant to do it boy, as often. Boy or girl. Both girls. Both girls. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like... But it, it, it could be it could be frustrating, especially when we yeah. love it so much and they don't. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess it's like the same with any sport, like a, you know, a soccer star that whose yeah. son doesn't want to play soccer. It's like it's you want to. Yeah. But when it comes to jujitsu or protecting yourself, it's different. It's, it's a, a life lifestyle. skill. It's a lifestyle. It's a life skill that we want them to learn. Just like looking both ways when you cross the street. I also want you to be able to protect yourself if somebody was to grab you on, the, you know, on the street and, and the, or you're out drinking at a party or yeah. at a bar and somebody grabs you. What do you, what do you do? You do not know what you're going to do. You think you know what you're going to do, but you don't in that moment. You're just like, Oh my God, I'm being attacked and you're being attacked while you're thinking about it and not knowing what to do. It's your most traumatizing event that you're not ready for. Yeah. And then if it happens, we hope to God it never happens yeah. to anybody. But if that traumatizing event happens and you have a higher skill level, the, rate of you being able to succeed and not have that event happen to you or be able to succeed in that event is going to be way higher. We know that you and I know that it's hard to explain it to, to like our daughters or to like our wives and stuff because they just don't understand it. And they're just, Oh, it's not going to happen to me. Um, and that's what jujitsu is so important for because police officers go to work every day and are in the line of duty yeah. every day. Right there. I, I read a stat or something that was like a police officer will see 70 or 80 critical events in their lifetime versus the average civilian may see one. Yeah. Right? Like, that's a lot. Yeah. I try to, when, I, when I'm telling friends and people that don't train why I do this or why they should do it, and I said, I call it, and I don't know if I got this from somewhere. I, I don't think I ever heard anybody say it. I call it the quiet confidence. Mm. I feel like I can walk in. I know I, I've had a lot of fights barroom brawls and, and <laughs> stupid things with friends when I didn't know how to fight, when I never trained a day, had a punching bag and, you know, in the, in the yard or in, in an apartment. And I, you know, had the little, the Everlast set up and, you know, I thought I knew what I was doing. As soon as I started to train jujitsu, I never had another fight. I've never had to use it. I've never gotten into a scuffle, nothing because it's just the mindset changes. When I was getting into fights, I had something to prove. 
when I learned how to fight, I'm, number one, the first thing was like, oh shit, I don't know what every, what all these other guys know because I'm, I'm training with accountants, some law enforcement. This guy's a real estate agent. This guy's a skinny little freaking, you know, accountant. You know, like all walks uh, the of lawyer. Life. Yeah, it's just like you. Ju- and I realized I didn't know what I was getting into because I never knew what those. Are. I didn't know that I was up against somebody that could know way more than me, but not look like it. But I, that quiet confidence, I I felt like, um, I could walk into any room, any bar, any situation, walk down just about any road, and feel confident that barring somebody taking out a gun and pointing it at me. Um, and now I do carry and you know, it's Florida yeah. and everybody carries down here now. But before that, I felt like super confident that barring, a, you know, an incident with a gun that I was super confident that I could take care of myself. And it, and I stopped walking into a room with like, my chest puffed out, like looking for the fight and more of just like, if something's going on over there, I'm going to be over there. Like, you know, you, you're not looking for yeah. that problem where I was looking for that problem. Because, I don't, I don't know why, whatever the mindset was and the friends that I hung out with, like we were looking for the trouble or like it was fun. And then it's, as soon as I started training, it was like the exact opposite. But that quiet confidence is what I try to tell people. Like you don't understand how confident you are going to be in just about any situation, whether it's work, you know, just a work situation when you're talking in front of people, the confidence that this gives you and the way that people look at you when they do find out, like there's a certain level of respect that winds up coming along with it, that feeds that that confidence that you have. I mean, that's usually my pitch besides the fact, the health aspects and just, you know, knowing self-defense and things like that. But how good is that relating over to law enforcement for administrations to hear? Yeah. That, hey, we're... We're, we used to want to get into the fights, but now we train more. We don't, we avoid the mm-hmm. fight. That's almost like a form of de-escalation in itself, right? Yeah. Or we're going to be more calm under the situation because we don't need to fight this guy. We do that in, in, in our hobbyist time on, on the side, right? We, we just want to be professional about it. And then, you know, the, the other good thing I thought you said there too was like, uh, it's not just work, okay? W- what does jujitsu do for you? Hey, if you're at the mall and you didn't bring your con- concealed carry, you don't have your knife, whatever, and someone tries to take your kid or your wife, can you protect them? I'm yeah. just gonna, I just go red. Right. Oh, okay, you're just sound gonna, familiar, Bo? I'm just gonna go <laughs> red, right? I'm just gonna. Go I red. see red and I go crazy, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that's not gonna help you, bro. Yeah. Like yeah. if you have a guy that has bigger attributes than you and you don't know how to fight and yeah. and he doesn't know how to fight the attributes are going to win like you can't even protect your family then you know and i don't know if you know uh follow mr jujitsu online oh yeah his interview yeah. classic right like him, him and <laughs> the i did, guy, the, him the, and yeah, i had a fight to win we we were matched yeah, up on a fight yeah. to win but he's a great dude right i love his i and love his stuff he is constantly posting like Oh, you don't do jujitsu? Happy Mother's Day! Yeah. Or like, <laughs> right? Like those types yeah. of things. Where no, like, I love it. I love his stuff. But he'll yeah. be, he he constantly, jokingly is saying this, but it's true. If if you don't know how to do any sort of jujitsu or martial mixed martial arts, you can't even protect yourself, let alone your family. Mm. You can't. Yeah. Right. So yeah. like, it's more it, it's more than just work, right? It's I, more than just work. <laughs> you made me think about the ones, and I don't know if he's put this out. I know there are memes. When, you know, like, uh, if you got your ass kicked in front of your girl and then she's just like, like the girl's walking away, yeah. like, you know, um, but yeah, imagine being in that situation where you couldn't protect a loved one that, where you should have been, where you could have easily, maybe the person was smaller and you should have, if you knew mm-hmm. how to protect yourself, you could have easily, again, either deescalated, yeah. shown that confidence and deescalated or protected yourself from that person. And it, it's, uh. Yeah, those memes are hilarious. He's funny. Yeah, he's but that's I he's, he's like uh, he's he's pretty direct. Like he's yeah. I don't want to say over the top because I love his stuff, but he's uh, unfiltered. And he's the most and, laid back dude. You'll is he really? Yeah, yeah. He's, and he's re- yeah. he's really cool. He's just laid back. Yeah. He's like you know a friend of mine. Uh, you know when we got partnered up for a fight to win, which wasn't ideal because I I'm not a huge fan of competing against people that I know. Like I, I just don't like it because like. Uh, yeah. uh, I have trouble. Like I, I never want to injure anybody in like competition, but like you never want to get to a point where like you're an injure uh, an acquaintance or a friend, sure, right? So like I always try to avoid those matches of case. But we had fun yeah. and it was good. Time. So we had a lot more questions, but we're running out of time. We we we've we've only got a few minutes. But I'm going to ask you the this one last question. Uh, this was uh, Mason Junior from Facebook. He said, "Jay, I have a question. Did they ever find your gun?" Yeah, so, what, what's that situation? So he would be what I would call uh, an asshole coworker, <laughs> and uh, um, 
So I, I love to bust balls and, and, and prank everyone. Like I'm, I was like the prankster at work, right? And I okay. Like if something happened, I was the first to get the meme out or the first to get the group text out. And I think it was back in like 2014. Uh, I had parked my truck in my in, at my residence and um, I had locked it. I had left for the airport early that morning to take uh, someone over to the airport. And when I came back at six in the morning, someone had broken into my truck and they had, they had broke the uh, on the Silverados. They have the lock boxes in the, in sure, the yeah, seat. Yeah, yeah. They had ripped it right open and they had stolen my gun and it never got found. No. So that's like the one thing those guys can bust my balls about. Is that so now was that your on duty gun or your off duty gun? Because if you lose your on duty, right, isn't that it, like a big so it was it was so it's a big deal either I've, way? I brought home I brought home up in that point maybe my on duty gun like eight times in my whole life. Say that again? You I'd only brought home my on duty gun like eight you times. You would leave it actually at yeah, the department. The, the okay. department I worked at, you would drive into work, change there, I'd leave everything in the locker there, okay. I'd wear my concealed carry back and forth. Gotcha. Um it it was actually like uh, my, my wife's wedding shower weekend. So all our family and stuff were in, we we're going to go shooting. So I brought a couple extra wit home. And, uh, so it was in my truck time with the work the next morning. So, yeah. So it was your on duty gun. Oh, yeah. How much shit did you have to go through? I, no, does it matter? Like, I didn't get in trouble. Like someone broke into my car and like, okay. they stole it. Right. Like, like my car got broken. And that's your it. choice it, to leave it in the, in at, at the so, department. Like, or is it like requirement? Like, no, leave no. your. No, there's no requirement. No, okay. so um, you can have it with you. But like we always say, like general orders are always made up from someone's either dumb Back mistake up. or mistake. <laughs> so now it's like if you take home a piece of equipment from the police department, the new SOP or general order is it has to be locked inside the residence. Is it thanks to you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I remember I just always remember like my father had his off duty piece and he did not leave the house. Like he'd go up to just like play the lotto at the store yeah. and be back in 10 minutes. And he always like had, it. is that a requirement in Florida or your department to always, if you're a police officer, as long as you're not drinking to have your no. a weapon on you? No, no, there's, there's no requirements. I feel like uh, it was required off. back then. Um, and it might've been, there wasn't, I, yeah. I carry almost no. all the time, almost yeah. everywhere I go. And, and the reason being is that I only carry sometimes then like that bad sequence is going to happen when you don't have it on you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. like, if you think about like, now I fly a lot, so like I have to declare, and sometimes like if I know my schedule's tight, I won't. But then I'll have like my concealed knife with me, right? I know it's yeah. not a gun, but like a knife within four or five feet of someone to me, like if I'm locked in a room with someone, I'll give them a gun and I'll have a knife all day long. Yeah, if I can touch them, like if I'm in the distance to touch you and they haven't presented it yet, like I'll take a knife all day. So long. how do you declare if you're taking the weapon? Do they put it under the plane with the baggage? Yeah, you, you have, have to, to give it up. It. Right? Okay, yeah, and it has it. to be in a locked box inside. A locked suitcase. Has do they TSA also keep locks. the? Do you have to keep the ammunition separately, or does it, yeah, it all go? Well, it can be. It just can't be in that locked box. It okay. can be in the locked, same locked suitcase. So I carry okay. a Pelican case. Okay. Uh, I have like a metal box that I carry with a gun in. And I just have the ammo outside it. Okay. It has to be clear. That that box has to have a lock on it. And then you have to have TSA approved locks on the outside. With all the craziness that's happening in the world, I have stopped leaving my everyday carry in the car. Like sometimes I was just yeah. let me leave it in the car and let me go into the store. And now it's. The uh, amount of good guys always that stop bad guys with guns is crazy. We just don't hear about them. Yeah. Like there's that one active shooter in that mall. That dude made a 40 yard shot on that guy. With a Which, oh yeah. With a handgun. Really? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. That was a civilian, yeah. right? Like, so, um, how many people get shot and killed if he's not caring? Yeah. That's what I always think. Or like, if I'm with my family or my kids, like I'm not caring and something bad happens, like I'm going to like never forgive myself. Yeah. I mean, I have, n I've only carried in like my forties, this is relatively yeah. new for me because I mean, it was post Parkland. I mean, we're, you know, Parkland's right here. I live in the town yeah. over from Parkland and Coral Springs. Um, and I didn't even, I got like the, I did the class that you have to do down here to, to, to get your license to, to conceal carry. And, and, and I still didn't wind up getting it for you. And then like another shooting happened and I'm like, I think it's time. And then I just started yeah. to get into that world a little bit, but um, yeah, I, I never, my father was a cop. I never, the only time I touched a gun was when he retired and he mm -hmm. bought a, he was, it was easier for him to buy uh, a, like his Smith and Wesson. Yeah. I guess it was the two guns. They were going to the Glock and a Smith and Wesson on the, on the job. And he was able to purchase and then he would be able to keep that one when he retired. Yeah. That's and, pretty and, common. And you I, can buy your gun when you retire. I held that one. I remember that's the only time in my life that I held a gun before I came here. 
and I went shooting with my first jujitsu coach and I was in my forties already. Okay. And he, you know, he had bought his AR and a few different guns and he was, you know, ex-military. Yep. So he had all the toys. Um, but I never touched anything. I never carried until and at post Parkland and still like probably a year after Parkland. But yeah. now I just kind of think it's, again, I don't want to be in a situation where I myself or a loved one is in a position that I can't protect them. And, yeah. and again, it almost also goes with the jujitsu goes to like, you don't know who knows what, you know, it's also like, you don't know who's carrying now down here. No. And it's just like, yeah. I call it the Wild West down here, you yeah. know, but um, it, this is crazy. Coming from Long Island, you, you know, you, you nobody could carry. You couldn't carry in New York. Right. And uh, to this, it's just, it's strange. But look how many people are carrying down here, and it's not like people are getting active shooters every week. Like, the amount of people that are carrying guns here and nothing bad's happening yeah. is, like, the the nationwide of what don't people don't think about, yeah. right? Like, hey, Texas, or not Texas, Florida has no concealed permit anymore so yeah it's gone right yeah as long as you're not a criminal right you can carry yeah. so it's like how many people are carrying i'm yeah. sure tons and tons and tons how many active shooters are having not i mean it, it's going to happen here and there because violence is always going to happen you're never going to stop violence but the more of those good people that you have that are trained and carry the the safer we're going to be you know eventually obviously mental health is an issue and we need to talk about um you know how to to purchase weapons should the purchase i and listen i'm I'm a huge a2 supporter but like i'm not against them saying hey you have to do a quick background check like i'm okay with that i think that's a good thing right like if i have yeah. to wait a day or two to purchase a weapon i'm i'm okay with that right mm -hmm. run the background checks of uh, fingerprint people that's fine uh maybe do a mental health history checkup i would be okay with that but if i'm <laughs> if i'm a legal citizen i have none of those issues i'm not a criminal i don't have mental health then i should be able to own the weapons that i want to own I I definitely I was definitely way more conservative on the issue of of everyone having guns until what just happened in Israel. Yeah. And people, you know, these terrorists walking into homes and taking people out and then post after that they're like giving now the government's giving guns to people that live on those borders. I, good luck at anybody who thinks that they're going to be able to take a gun away from anybody in the United after States that. after that I ever know. again is not going to happen. And I'm going to say that I usually, you know, again, I've, I've talked about, it. I just bought an AR. I just, I'm waiting, yeah. I'm waiting for it to, to pick it up. Like, I'm like, there's no way like that. It could happen anywhere. It could happen anywhere. Not maybe not to that degree and soldiers walking in, but you know, a, you right. know, a, a home invasion. And I'm like, I'm just not going to, I don't want to take that risk. And I also wanted, I was like, let me get it before, you know, if there is some regulations that come into place, you know, let me have it before. I think after COVID, after like all of the Israel stuff, um, after, it's going to be impossible. <laughs> yeah, after like you saw all these riots and people like, you know, kicking and stealing stuff and breaking into people's houses, like it is going to be so difficult to to do that. Like I, I think they push that narrative. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's. And I don't think it'll be possible. For, the, it'll be. We'd have to have a long Court lull, has, like a long yeah, lull. In, the Supreme Court already came down and said like just a couple of weeks ago said that California's ban on extended mags like the right is is unconstitutional really right so like um they're saying you have to have like what like New York has safe act like seven I think the motion carries seven right unless you're a police officer or something else California had a similar thing on extended mags the Supreme Court came down and said no that's you can't do that that's a win right mm -hmm. so like I'm sure now you'll see the Supreme Court in New York do the same thing and it's just gonna follow suit yeah because the Constitution is there for, to what? Stop government from being able to take over what they do. Now, to a point, right, the government's there to make everyone safe, but you have to do it to abide to, like, why did they put that in there? Not for hunting, not for fishing. They did it because they didn't want the government to take over the people again. That's why that's in there, and that's why it should be in there. Now, is there limitations to all the amendments? Of course there is as society changes, but, like, understanding why they're in there and what you can limit it's something I've, people don't think about. I've, uh, I'm no among, uh, amongst my friends. I'm the lefty liberal, and yeah. I've definitely moved to the center on on yeah. at least this gun issue because just being down here. And again, like it's okay. There, there's been the school shootings, but we're not hearing about you know. I, I don't feel like we're hearing about the shootings in the in the right. way that people think. Yeah. I, 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 the a perfect example is the uh, girl that work, works at my gym that works the front desk. She's from Texas, and she was talking about open carry, and she said. Oh yeah, my brother. One time, he took a gun to school and he got like a little slap on the wrist. He's like shocked that he could, you know, that he didn't get into more trouble. 
And I was just like, what are the shootings like there? You know, other than like a mass shooting, she's like, they're just not shootings. Like everybody carries. So nobody's pulling a gun on anybody right. and shooting them it is because everybody carries, right? Carry. It's really strange. And she's like, yeah, it's just, it's just not like that. You would think, right? Oh my God, everybody's got a gun. Everybody's shooting each other. Like, Hey, that's my water. You know, like that's just not happening. Yeah. Right. Um, again, and then the, coming out of my mouth, my friends, you know, know me as somebody who's way more liberal than I haven't was like an advocate, at least for the background checks. I think yeah. it's just smart. I don't want everybody to have a gun. I'd prefer that I'm the guy with the gun and nobody, you know, right. Everybody wants that. You want to be the person with the, with the weapon. But now I'm just like, good, good luck telling people that they, you know, can't have a gun in their house after what just happened. Like people were literally babies grandmothers were taken out of their home and the, and nobody they're not allowed to have a weapon it would be trying to it, 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 i relate it to like them trying to lock the u.s down again yeah like that's probably never gonna oh happen. that would yeah that would never at least, at least not in in a multiple decades where people that were alive for that yeah at the age that can understand that they'll allow that to happen yeah i just I don't agree. think it will i agree thank you to feito it and av specializing in commercial and residential automation, security cameras, CCTV, POS, and more. Check them out at feitoitav.com or call 305-428-2515 and let them know the dummy sent you. Special thank you to the crew over at Flow & Roll for all their support. Flow & Roll is renowned for their incredible Nogi rash guards, shorts, and leggings. Flow & Roll has quickly become the premier custom apparel provider for academies big and small throughout the United States. Reach out today to discuss your custom order and ask about their incredible pre-order program. You can send an email to flowenroll at gmail.com or visit their Instagram at flow underscore n underscore roll and shoot them a direct message. And yes, they can create an awesome custom gi for your academy as well. Visit flowenroll.com to check out their awesome designs and while you're there, pick up a jujitsu dummy signature tee exclusively at flowenroll.com. And remember... You'll get 20% off your purchase of T-shirts, rash guards, or geese with code JJD. All right, we're going we're gonna to finish it out, man. I really appreciate you coming out, man. Thank you so Thanks. much for doing this. Thank you for taking the trip down. Yeah. My apologies that I can't take you to lunch. i got to run to the to see my mom at the no hospital. Worries. I have dinner plans but, tonight because i okay, got the family. You you got people, do you have people down here, or are you going right straight back up? I'm, I'm going to go straight back up because... Okay. Uh, again, i got tonight and tomorrow with the kids, and then i got to leave for 12 days. So. Okay. All right. Well, have a safe trip. Again, thank you for doing this. Uh, check us out on uh, on uh, Instagram, at Jiu-Jitsu Dummies. You can see all the ways to watch, listen, and support. I'm Uncle Milty BJJ on Instagram. I didn't wind up giving your handle. We'll put it on screen when we, when we introduce you, but why cool. don't you give your two handles, yep. your personal so, and the uh, EFC? My personal one's Wads BJJ, W-A-D-S BJJ. That's my personal page. And then uh, the company page is EF Combatives. All right, man. Again, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. Peace, love, Jiu-Jitsu. We'll see.